Um, I'd like to call this open curriculum meeting to order. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Lasusa, and he will introduce our speakers for the evening. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a few of these meetings a year where we invite a uh, staff member of ours, typically a supervisor, to present to the curriculum committee about um, uh, whatever it is that's important and pertinent and um, re relevant in their particular departments. Uh, we thought we'd change it up a tiny bit this time around, and because we have been speaking a lot about student wellness, student well-being, <coughs> uh, critical issues regarding students and uh, the choices that they make that we uh, decided last month to invite our student assistants, counselors, Lisa Latarulo and Alex Emmer to a curriculum committee meeting to speak with the uh, committee members. And then we wanted them to present publicly so they could share uh, with a wider audience uh, what they're seeing in terms of our students and uh, the kinds of um, trends and, and so forth that they see in their offices on a daily basis. So uh, Lisa Latarulo was actually hired the same year I was in the school district back in 2001. Alex and Emmer is a newer addition, uh, maybe year five or so. And Alex works at the middle school, Lisa works at the high school. These are two of our key players that are behind the scenes um, and dealing with big important issues every single day that uh, don't get the headlines or the attention that maybe uh, other issues receive sometimes. But they're really important folks in the school district and see about uh, 2,000 students if you go from grade six through 12, and um, I'm delighted that they agreed to come here tonight, so I'm gonna turn it over to them. Their presentation will probably run uh, something like 40 minutes, and uh, there'll be time for questions, and of course, if you have any questions along the way, you can ask them uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna stand here. Wherever That's you're fine. comfortable. Wherever you oh, like. Is that okay? Do you prefer up here, Lisa? Hi. What's your preference? That's fine, I can stand here, as, as long as, what do we, we have this for moving the slides? Yes, Okay. the arrow. Um, that's fine. So I'm Lisa Ladarulo. This is Alex. Alex Emmer. <laughs> and just so you know about our positions, I mean, we are um, counselors in the district. So we all have, all the school counselors have master level degrees in counseling. But for Alex and I, as student assistance counselors, in order for us to have that certification, we have to have additional training in substance abuse, prevention, and intervention. So we have sort of, you know, that extra um, that is done professionally outside of that, that counseling degree. Um, and that, I, you know, really helps us in aiding us to do what we're doing in our position. I would say also one thing that we find in our jobs, we are doing substance abuse, but we do a lot of mental health. Um, that's primarily what we're spending our time doing is mental health counseling. Um, and I would say right now where we sort of consider ourselves this year, we seem to have had it sort of an uptick in the number of cases that we are seeing. Um, and we kind of qualify ourselves as crisis counselors because we're often dealing with crises um, at the school level. You want to add anything or before I get started? I guess that's pretty much it. We do a lot of individual counseling. We do group counseling. Um, so along with the substance abuse prevention, we're also doing um, different types of counseling with the students as well and getting involved in different programming. Um, so, and then a lot of crisis management as well. So that's a little bit of background on what you know our positions are. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the drug trends, primarily because at the high school, I would say, we see more of the substance using than when you do at the middle school. That's not to say that middle school kids are not using. The trend, if you start looking at national um, statistics, the trend is definitely that kids are starting to use at a younger and younger age. And I would attribute a lot of that to access. They have access to each other, and they have access to drugs more easily and more readily. Um, probably what I would say is because of their cell phones. Okay? They have a lot more access to each other, and therefore access to other people that they would probably never even speak to in their lives, but they can connect with them um, through social media and through other networks that way. Um, so some of the things that, you know, what I'm seeing at the high school, still alcohol is the primarily, primary source that, of um, substance that kids use um, and abuse. Um, the alcohol that they're using certainly is, you know, they're using beer, but they're also using hard liquor. And not, a, not uncommon for them to fill a water bottle filled with vodka, and that's their drink for the evening. And if you're drinking a water <laughs> bottle full of vodka, 
you are probably getting to very, very high levels of intoxication. And I think a lot of kids are not really aware of that. And so they're doing it because it's sort of the norm. That's what their peers are doing. Um, marijuana is also another drug um, that they are turning to. And some of the other things that I'm seeing, but less of them, but they are here. They are here in Chatham, is cocaine, LSD, synthetics. Synthetics are, most of them are from China. They're really hard to detect. Drug treatment centers can't detect them. They're really hard to check, you know, check in a drug screening. Um, and they change rapidly. But the synthetics can mimic marijuana. They can mimic amphetamines. They can mimic all sorts of different things that kids are getting a high off of. Um, and I'm going to talk about vaping in a minute, and that's where the synthetics can be um, added into that, where people wouldn't even know that they're there. And then the prescription pills, Xanax, Adderall, and opiates even, that they're using. And they're getting access mostly through that from their friends. So they're getting that access through friends and through medicine cabinets at home. Okay, so vaping. This is, I would say, probably the hot topic. Um, and it's not just here in Chatham. It is all school districts are dealing with vaping in this area. Um, it's a problem. Um, I think administrators would attest to that, that it is a problem. It's also hard to catch these kids. Because of the devices that are available, the devices have been manufactured and marketed. And I think that the marketing has been very clever to young people. They make it very enticing for young people because there's flavorings that you can put inside. Um, they, you know, this is, this is just, this is the new trend. And unfortunately, it's, it goes very undetected. The devices are very sleek. Um, they're designed to be that way so that they can hide them. They can quickly slide them into their pocket. They can put it in their underwear their socks. I mean, they can get away with it very easily. Um, and that's, you know, that's why they're getting away with it. And they can have these devices with them. Um, and, you know, it can, it's definitely very problematic. When you look at the products that they're using, Juul is the most common product that we see in Chatham. And they have these pods that connect to the Juul. And those pods, if they go through one pod, it's equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. So I've even heard of kids that go through three pods in a day. Okay, So that's a lot of nicotine into their system. Now the difference, you know, obviously with cigarettes is that you're getting all these other chemicals, right? And so they say, oh, this, this is safe because in cigarettes you're getting the smoke and all these carcinogens and all these chemicals that are in a cigarette, so this is safe. And if you actually do Google searches on these vaporizers and these vape pens, the first like 10 Google searches you get will come from the vaping manufacturers. And of course, their information is going to be skewed. So if an adolescent is getting online to look at information, they may not be very critical of who the, the actual source is and who's putting the information out there. And then the information is very positive. It's in a very positive light. So that can be also problematic in terms of them getting um, the right information. Um, and what we know statistically that teens who vape are three times more likely to start using cigarettes. So they will move on to cigarettes. I would say that if they're vaping and they're vaping the nicotine now, that certainly it is going to be easier for them to move over to vaping marijuana. The devices are pretty similar looking. There's a little bit of a difference in them. Um, but the whole um, how you use it is exactly the same. It's just what's the product that's in it. So for them to go from vaping nicotine to vaping marijuana, they may not see what's the big deal. Um, and I would say that is something we all, as adults, really need to be aware of because obviously the marijuana laws are going to be changing here in New Jersey. This is going to be legalized. Um, what are we going to do about that? And we can, you know, as a school district, obviously it will be illegal, but their accessibility to the this the, to marijuana is going to just skyrocket. There's there's no doubt. And if you actually look at there's reports that come out of Colorado and they say the suspensions in schools are up. Um, you know, kids you know getting going into drug treatment centers are up because their accessibility to it. Um, can I just ask in terms of the sure. um, you know switching from the. Uh, 
regular, the vaping to the actual marijuana pods. Um, where are they getting the pods? Because wouldn't that be... I mean, okay, so there's 21 and older to buy the okay. nicotine. But these kids, it's very easy for them to get it. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty familiar where, where kids are going. Um, you know, they can walk into certain places and they're selling them to kids. It's not, they're just so not being very dis stores, discerning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can also get it online. Uh, if somebody, um, so what, you know, kids are pretty clever, right? So they will have, um, they'll get like Visa gift cards. And some of these sites will take their Visa gift card. So they got a Visa gift card for Christmas. It's got a hundred bucks on it. Now I can go online and buy what I need online and it'll get it delivered to their house. So, you know, something will pop up. It'll say, are you 21 and over? And you just check, yes. I mean, they're not checking anything about you, right? So you, that access is very easy. Uh, the same is with marijuana. I mean, kids are buying this on, online. They're going to shop, they're getting smoke shops that are online in Colorado, and they go on and off online. You know, they're trying to be online for a presence. They get a certain, they grab a certain clientele, and then they go offline because they know what they're doing. They can't be doing this because they can't be selling to people outside of the state. Um, but it's happening. Kids are, they're admitting that they're doing these things. Um, so I know that that's going on. So, you know, what's happening, this whole, the marijuana piece of it is, um, to me, this is going to be a whole new territory for everybody because the, the marijuana that they're using is different. So some adults may say, oh, well, I used marijuana when I was in college or I did when I was younger. Um, it's no big deal. What's the big deal about it? Well, this is a different type of marijuana that they're using. It's much more potent and intense. So back in the 70s, dry leaf marijuana, which somebody would put into a joint or a cigarette, the THC level, THC is the psychoactive substance in marijuana that they get high off of, um, it was between 4 and 6%. But if they're using today, the dry leaf is already higher, right, because these, these plants are being grown to have to higher THC levels. So already, the marijuana today is different than it was several decades ago because it already have, has a higher level. But now they're using these things like oils and dabs. That's a picture of a dab. And a dab would go, it's this oily, waxy substance, and they put it into a vaporizer, just like an oil can be put in a vaporizer, but they make what are called dab pens, and they're sort of preloaded with this dab substance in it. Um, but that's where you're talking about THC levels, 60 to 80 percent. It's very intense, that kind of high. Kids may have a very strong reaction to this, extremely strong, where there may be some vomiting. Um, they may be what they say is sort of like greening out, like they get so high, they get disoriented. Um, they may be more likely to have hallucinations, but they may have this sort of paranoia that comes over them because it's so intense something that they're maybe not used to at all. Okay, so this is like a whole nother, I mean, this is just a, an entirely different territory that we really are not familiar with as a society. We're really not. So, you know, the laws are, are going ahead of science here. Um, and, you know, the, we're going to legalize marijuana, but there's still, we don't know all the science behind it, but we're doing that anyway. Um, so this is just something, you know, people need to be aware of it. That's how I look at it. People need to be aware of this, um, what is out there and what kids may have access to. The other thing is, is if they're using these vape <coughs> pens or these dab pens and they're doing the THC oil, the odor is very minimal. So it's different. So it's not going to be as detected. And then, you know, most of the time when people think of somebody being high on marijuana, that they have the red glassy eyes, they may actually not present that way if they've been vaping. Okay, because that smoke is not being created that may create some of that redness. Um, redness also comes from dilation, but some people just don't dilate as much as other people. So some people may not even have that red, that, that standard identification may not even be present. Okay, um, so our CHS survey that we did last year in December of 2016, I know you all have had access to that report and have seen it comprehensively, but we had at the high school reported use of marijuana at 11.4%. Okay. All right. So um, some other things with drug trends. 
What is interesting is a lot of what's being anecdotally rep reported is that there's a lot of lot more students using, right? There's a lot more accessibility and students are using. However, locally, treatment and in New Jersey, really, treatment facilities for adolescents are closing. So there's becoming fewer and fewer treatment facilities for adolescents. Right? There's actually no place for an adolescent who is on opioids, if they're overdosing and need to go into a detox, there's actually not an adolescent unit that exists that in New Jersey. They can go into an adult facility, but you have to wait for beds for those types of things. So adolescent care is, is becoming more limited. Um, and also, Alex will talk about this, and that goes along with mental health as well. Okay, so access to um, resources is becoming more limited. Um, so what we're sort of seeing what, at the high school is there are very few students that are sent out for under the influence. That's our policy in district, right? And that's really what all school districts have. They have an under the influence policy. So somebody has to say something's going on for this student right now. They appear to be under the influence. Something's not right here. And so that student would be sent out for a drug screening. Okay, and they also have to be cleared by a doctor before they can return to school. That's our policy. That's what school districts <coughs> across New Jersey have that policy. But we are not really identifying that many students that are under the influence. It's only, you know, a handful of kids in a given year. Does that mean that we just don't have a lot of kids coming to school on, on drugs? Personally, I would say that's not true. I would say there are plenty of kids coming to school that are using plenty more than what, are, what we're actually catching. Now, why are they getting away with it? Well, there may also be this, this thing that they're using so often that their normal is hard to detect when it's abnormal. Because when they're under the influence, that becomes the normal. So if a teacher is always seeing them in this certain light, they don't know what the difference is, right? So that may be part of it. Um, but it, it could also just be that we maybe need some more staff training. Okay, and you know, that's just something that, that comes from me and from Alex, of just something that we need to be doing on a regular basis, is just having some more of that staff training. But even with that, it's hard to really know if somebody's under the influence. You don't really know. So that's where the drug screening is really important. Um, I think that some people also look at that as like this is such a discipline looking thing, like this kid's gonna get in trouble and then they're not gonna go to college and it's gonna ruin their whole record. Um, I really look at it as if a student is going out and being screened and then they do come back positive, that's an intervention. That's a time for an intervention. That means that something's going on for that kid and now we can help them before they leave high school and before they go on to college where you're seeing that's the level where kids are getting really into substance using and they're dying because they're getting into opiates. So that 18 to 30 year old, um, that's where the major drug crisis lays. So if we actually, if kids are, you know, getting caught being under the influence in school, I really look at it as this is an opportunity for us to intervene and to maybe identify that there's a problem there and how can we help? How can we help them to maybe be better before they move on? And they're out of our sights, right? They don't have our support anymore <coughs> and they move on um, independently. Um, we have had graduates who have died from overdoses. We know this. Um, and I will tell you, of the ones that I am familiar with in recent years, none of those kids were identified in high school as having a drug problem. So they weren't kids coming through my office. They weren't identified. Does that mean that they just started using when they got to college? Probably not. They were probably using in high school. But it wasn't to a level that maybe was you know, being identified or people weren't stepping up and saying, like, this kid needs help. Um, they weren't reaching for help. Um, but unfortunately, then they went off to college and got really into a bad place. Um, so I, I just talk about that because I, I want people to understand that perspective, that intervention is, it can be a good thing. You know, it doesn't mean that these kids are getting in trouble and, that, and then, you know, we're ruining their lives and they're never going to go to college. Um, that's not the case, okay? We, we, we really want to make sure these kids are also well before they go off to their next step. So I'm going to move over to Alex, and she's going to talk about the mental health and suicide. 
and some of the other things that we're seeing, um, not necessarily just drug prevention that we work with, but we do a lot with um, mental health, um, a lot of different things that we're seeing. Um, so we're talking a lot about our students' well-being um, and our kids' uh, social and emotionally um, as a whole, the whole person. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different things um, come through our offices, um, a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of nervousness, um, a lot of depressive symptoms, um, a lot of voicing depressive symptoms, um, maybe suicidal thoughts, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, a significant increase in their stress level, um, even with just day-to-day -day stressors or day-to-day -day challenges that we might see that, you know, they come and go, um, but these kids are finding an incredible amount of stress in these day-to-day -day activities. Um, coupled with possibly because of a lack of coping skills, they can't seem to handle um, life's little upsets um, and during the day challenges and um, you know one bad grade um, in one class period might derail the rest of their day instead of you know you got a bad grade in math and we move on to science um, you kind of deal with science um, we're seeing just a general lack of coping skills and little upsets that happen for them might carry throughout their day and possibly the rest of their week substance use we see Lisa was just talking about we see that as um, partly it could be a um, like a side effect of the mental health piece that's happening. So they're not sure how to cope. They're seeing other students using substances. Um, they're seeing other students enjoying using these substances. So they might try that as a coping strategy. In short term, it might be successful for them. Um, so that's why we might see a little bit more of the substance use. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any indication on, on which one is driving which one? It's, yeah. it's hard to tell. It's, I think it's a lot of yeah. the chicken or the egg um, of which is driving which. So it could be that there's an underlying mental health concern that now the students are trying to self-medicate with substances or just try to use it recreationally to try to help. Um, or it could be that they're starting to use substances at a very young age. So now this is, um, you know, science-wise, it's causing a change in their brain. So then it's making it harder for them to cope with a lot of different things that life might kind of present to them. So we're, we're not totally sure. And I think there, a lot of the research says the same. That it is, a, it is um, they coincide a lot. And it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg. Um, and then we also see, I know at our, my level in the middle school, and you as well, we see a lot of self-injury also. Um, so as a way of kind of um, injuring themselves to cope with the emotional pain that might be happening on the inside. So some kids may act out, while others may turn it inside um, and injure themselves. Um, so we do see a lot of that as well. Um, and then friends kind of acting as a therapist. A lot of kids, especially at the middle school and high school level, they're confiding in their friends a lot. And whereas we would confide in our friends about the grades that we got or um, you know the different activities we were involved in, these kids are confiding about a lot of the emotions that they're feeling. And sometimes they're really strong emotions and they're talking about self-injury. They're talking about suicidal thoughts. That's a lot for a 14-year-old, for example, to kind of manage. So they've got their own stressors. Um, and then coupled with maybe their friends who mentally are not feeling so great. That's a lot of emotional um, kind of baggage, I guess, for them to hold on to. Um, so our age level is it's definitely an at-risk population. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death among teenagers, I believe nationally. Um, and we've had a number of local suicides. Um, these suicides don't just affect the high school that they were at or the middle school that they were at. Um, a lot of our students are familiar with these kids. They've either played on sports teams with them um, or through social media. They know them for whatever reason. They're, um, they're connected to the outside community a lot more than just their town. So our students could also be affected greatly by the suicides in the area. There's a, definitely, what Lisa was just talking about, a mental health crisis at the college level. Um, so we're, we have an opportunity to see them before they get to that level. So what supports can we maybe put in place before they get to that crisis level if they're in college and they're out on their own um, and don't have as many supports as they have when they're at K through 12. Um, so that health survey that we were talking about before was a K through 12 survey. You guys obviously are familiar with it. Um, one of the questions that we asked the students was during the past 12 months, so in the past year, um, did you ever seriously consider attempting suicide? So not really a passing thought, did you ever seriously consider attempting? 102 CHS students had and 50 CMS students had, which are very high numbers to us. If you look at percentages, it seems low and it's comparable to other national statistics, but that's 102 high school kids that we know and 50 CMS students that we know. So if we look at the suicide risk assessments that are coming through our desks or coming through our counselors and our child study team, the numbers don't match what the students are self-reporting at all. 
a little bit more at CMS. I think that's just because of their age. Um, they're becoming a little bit more vocal about their emotions. Um, they're feeling the highs and lows of emotions a little bit more than they had been in the past. I'm not sure how to cope with that. I think that why, might be why there's a little bit more at CMS. Um, but they're definitely not the 102 at the high school and the 50 at the middle school. So we're missing this whole population of kids that's either not identifying themselves as having a concern or they're just not presenting themselves as kids who have a concern with their mental health. How are they getting to this point? Um, like the risk assessments? You, where are you getting risk assessments would, you know, kids that need a risk assessment come through our door a couple of different ways. Um, sometimes in a standard counseling conversation, it comes out that they are thinking about suicide. Um, maybe a teacher or a friend sees cuts on their arm. Um, that's another, even, if, even though it's non-suicidal self-injury, that also could have a correlation and we want to make sure that they're not at risk of suicide. Sometimes parents will express a concern. It comes through a variety of different ways. Um, but whenever there's a report of a student that has either said something about suicide or thinking about suicide or um, self-injury, we always do a risk assessment on a student. So are students at risk? Um, there are some commonalities, and these are some of the things that um, we've heard of through workshops that we've attended, but also what we're seeing in our own, I guess, practices in school. There's a lack of connectedness. Um, beyond the technology. So a lot of the communication that these kids are having with each other outside of school is either through their phone, through Xbox. It's not a face-to-face -face conversation. It's not playing outside, um, getting into arguments and conversing and getting through conflict that way. Um, a lot of what happens is possibly through text message or through text in general, whatever the social media could be. Um, so they're not seeing tone. They're not hearing the tone of the person. They're not seeing their face. Um, so they're interacting in a very... I guess, distorted kind of way. Um, they're not seeing that person. They're not having that personal interaction. Um, the peer expectation of keeping up. Um, I recently had a conversation with a student that um, she had heard that if you didn't get recommended for all honors classes going into high school, you would not have enough credits to graduate. And this kid was panicking. Um, but obviously, we all know that to not be true. But if kids start having conversations like this, <laughs> Um, they take their, you know, peers' word that as that's what it is. So if they're talking about this, um, either in their friend group or in their grade level, that's concerning. So then a whole group of kids gets very, very anxious, and their stress level goes up, and their coping skills are not there to support them, um, and then it just kind of spirals from there. Um, so some of these things that we may know to not be accurate, if the kids are talking about it, there's a very, there's a peer competitiveness, and there's a just keeping up with each other. Um, Parent expectation. We are in a very high achieving district. Um, a lot of our parents have gone to not only college, Ivy League colleges, um, but having that, um, I guess, pressure, even if it's not directly said to the student, um, could be a little bit more of a pressure for the kids and kind of keeping up with, I know I'm in a very high achieving district, so I must take the highest level classes. Um, a lack of support um, skills and resilience, so those coping skills. Um, the resilience to get through those day-to-day -day challenges um, may not be there. Um, we're not seeing too much of kids being able to cope day-to-day, -day, or at least the kids that are coming through our offices. Um, a lack of ability to sit with discomfort. Um, kids are having a very hard time just being uncomfortable with something. Um, they get a bad grade back. They can't manage to sit with that. Um, it wrecks, like I said before, it may wreck their whole day or their whole week. Um, Failure is part of success. We have to fail. We have to learn from that. If they are not able to kind of get through those challenges, they're going to be put at a disadvantage when they're trying to move on to more challenging things in life. Because past, past the middle school is the high school. It's a different level of challenge. Past the high school is whatever you're doing outside of K-12. through um, There's going to be a whole different set of challenges that kids face. And if they don't have the ability to process those emotions, process those challenges or failures, and grow from them, then they're a little bit farther behind. Um, family dysfunction. If the family hierarchy is flip-flopped upside down, if the kids are, um, if parents are concerned with kind of being their kid's friend or not having strict boundaries, when the kids are, are the ages of the kids that we have, um, 6 through 12 especially, they need those boundaries. And they need to know where the line is. And if the line is blurred of where the boundaries may be, the kids are going to push it until they can find the line. And then all of a sudden, we have a hierarchy where 
the kids are kind of more in charge than the parents. Um, and then our LGBTQ plus community is always um, a more at-risk population. And of course, we see a lot of students that are in the LGBTQ community. Um, so we want to make sure that we're supporting them as well and knowing that they're an at-risk population. Um, so within our district, we have a lot of um, different things that are based on grade level. Um, so different things that are developmentally appropriate for kids. So we have yoga instruction at a lot of different levels. Some of the PE classes, the health classes, but also um, informally and after school programs. Um, some of the teachers may do a little yoga break during their, um, during their class. Um, mindfulness practices, we've talked a lot about mindfulness. Um, our teachers have been trained in mindfulness in different areas. Um, so trying to infuse those practices within our different grade levels. Um, the high school has a rest and relaxation room that is open to students as a drop-in, so they can come and sit in a peacefully designed room um, and try to take a little bit of a break from maybe their day-to-day -day in the high school. Um, similarly, at the middle school, we have just a little breathing room um, where kids need a pass to go, and they can spend about five minutes there just to decompress and try to learn how to self-manage those emotions, um, just kind of regroup and then go back to class. Um, at both of our levels, we have stress management groups. We teach the kids that it's not necessarily the main focus of why each of us are stressed, because everyone will experience stress in their lives. It's more important that we learn how to manage it and possibly use it to your advantage. So we teach strategies for resilience in those groups, and the kids get to practice them. Um, and then brain breaks. A lot of the teachers are doing brain breaks um, throughout their class period just to give the kids um, a little bit, literally a brain break um, during their class so that they can take five minutes, change the subject, stretch, do a yoga pose, um, so that they can learn the value of pausing for a little bit before they continue working. Um, so our recommendations and things that we were thinking about might be helpful. Um, increasing support staff. Like Lisa said before, we're doing a little bit more of crisis management these days um, and a little bit less prevention, I would say, because there's so many crises and band-aids that we're putting on. Um, so increasing the support staff, um, administrative staff training in substance abuse and in mental health. Um, if it comes from top down and we're all on the same page, it's really, really helpful so that the teachers feel supported if they're making a decision about if a kid is under the influence or mental health wise not doing so well in their class um, so that we're all kind of on the same page as a district. Um, teachers needing annual training and identifying substance abuse and mental health. Um, teachers needing more support on how to manage students with higher levels of mental distress. The teachers primarily did not go to school um, with mental health training, so they didn't get the, I guess, comprehensive mental health psych side of things that we had gotten as counselors. Um, so, but these teachers are seeing these kids every day in their classes more often than we are because we're not seeing these kids necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis, the teachers are. So helping them have the tools to manage. Um, curriculum, if we put in a specific suicide prevention curriculum within our health classes, um, we'll be able to have a common language throughout the grade level so that the kids will know what we're talking about from year to year. The language would be the same if their curriculum is the same. And the curriculum that we're looking at has a student component, but also a faculty and staff component, and also a parent component, so that across all of their worlds would also be using the same language. Um, so we think that this could be really supportive. We were looking at lifelines in particular um, as a program. And then the parent education piece um, we think is really important. So kind of going along with that suicide prevention um, curriculum, the parent education on substance use, on um, mental health concerns, on suicide prevention um, is really key as well so that we are all, we have them during the day, but parents have them in the evenings, on the weekends, and in lives in general. Um, so for all of us to be kind of on the same page, um, attendance at a lot of suicide prevention or substance abuse prevention programs historically has been low. Um, um, maybe because people think, well, it's not going to be my kid. But we can all be involved together in looking out for all the different kids and knowing what's going on. They'll always be two steps ahead of us. So the more information that we have, the better. Um, a lot of our students participate in sports and athletics. If we looked at that parent population alone, that would be a huge amount of parents that would get involved. So if we made part a parent education piece in conjunction with the athletics program, that may be a great place to reach a lot of parents. Um, oh, sorry, Alex, before yeah. you go off that slide, yep. just a quick question on the training. And I think Mrs. Clark also had a question. I saw her jot down the same note. What do you recommend um, from a training perspective? Outsourcing it, professional development day, is that not enough time? I mean, a half a day in the morning doesn't seem like it's going to 
move the needle? What, what specifically are you recommending? What we've looked at before in the beginning of the year, we kind of present to the faculty at our faculty meetings just briefly at the beginning of the year, um, just to kind of go over the policy and remind them of what to look for. Um, but maybe something more comprehensive. I don't know if we've talked about something specific yet, um, but that's okay. definitely something that we should Maybe look you at. wouldn't mind taking that away as a takeaway. Even if you send a few people out, get extensive training, and yeah. then bring them back in-house to kind of train the trainer, right. and maybe disseminate the information. I mean, I certainly i yeah. am way out of my wheelhouse, but I thought no. maybe if you could take that back and then make you come back to some recommendations Absolutely. for Dr. Lasusa cool. to consider, that would be great. Absolutely, thank you. Us. And something that you know I had noted too is just it seems um, oftentimes, and I can speak because I'm in the education profession also, mm -hmm. PDs are kind of like one and done and check the box. I think this has to be something that's kind of spread out over a continuum where um, it's an overwhelming topic, it's not a comfortable topic, and so maybe small sound bites kind of tackle each one at a time over the course of the span of a year or two mm -hmm. years, whatever it takes, yep. so that we can gain that comfort, that conversation, and that staff, teachers, whoever it is, can kind of get their inroads with the students and be speaking right. that same language language, but I would hate to see it just like one thing at the beginning of the right. year, I think, conversation. But something else um, on the recommendations that I wrote down, and I've been saying this for the four years that I've been on the board, um, I think we have a generation of very disconnected kids, kids who are, con and I know specifically in high achieving communities, these kids have parents who are very involved, who are fixing things for their kids all the time, and really helping them, and doing it because they love them. But I think we need to be looking at our kids and explicitly teaching them <coughs> how they don't know how to solve a problem. They don't know how to advocate for themselves. Yeah. So I think when looking at recommendations, how can we build into the curriculum, almost like role playing, mm -hmm. this is what it looks like, right. this is what it sounds like, this is what you can do. Because I think we have kids that are so used to pushing a button and clicking something or mm -hmm. going to their parents, help me, can you fix this? And as parents, we want to do that. We want to do anything to help our kids, but it's almost to a deficit at times. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see something student-based in there. That goes back to the, do, are we doing things with our kids? Are we doing it for our kids? Um, we talk about restorative practices a little bit, and that's part of the restorative practices is that we're doing things with kids. As administrators, as teachers, we're helping them go through it and guiding them in it, not necessarily doing it for them. So I really appreciate that you said that. And I'm sorry, Alex, on that last point, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Gilfillan had mentioned this during the uh, committee session, could you also craft something or make some recommendations on how best to educate the parents, and you know, whether it's a mandatory online class or mm -hmm. mandatory session, mm -hmm. but something that's more invasive mm -hmm. than we've, because what we've been doing isn't working, right? We're seeing too many kids committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And if they're concerned about ruining their lives, well, imagine if their freshman at college committed suicide. Right. That is a real ruined life. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think I'm going to ask you to, you know, don't be afraid, step out there, you know, we'll take the heat, but if, <coughs> if the choice is saving a kid or not saving a kid, exactly. I say bring it on. Make it as invasive as possible to reach the largest audience. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to keep you on the, oh, sorry. No, you're fine. I just have another question. Mm -hmm. um, going back a few slides sure. where we said, um, keep going, that one. This one? No, that one, yep. So uh, lack of connection beyond technology. Mm -hmm. So would it be uh, prudent to, I mean, I, I see this as a profile, right? So this is a profile of, of an at-risk uh, kid. And I think <coughs> we can add to that profile um, you know, participation in extracurricular activities. I would imagine that many of the kids that you see may not be taking advantage of those. And, and how do we encourage more of that? Mm -hmm. Some are. Some we see the opposite end of the spectrum where they're so overscheduled that they don't have the downtime either. Um, so definitely being involved in social activities outside of school, um, whether it be a sports team, whether it be something in the arts, whatever the extracurricular activity might be that they're interested in. Um, so they're getting that practice of social skills outside of school, but also not to the extreme where they're so overscheduled that there's zero downtime as well. Um, so that could probably also be a risk factor, but definitely. So we're just going to briefly discuss you know, this idea of resilience and um, what we're sort of getting to here is how do we teach kids um, more resilience. Um, we really would say that that's what we see on a regular basis. I mean, all school counselors, whenever we were talking about kids, we often will say, why can't they cope? They have no coping skills. They can't deal with like the slightest thing. I mean, they get a B in a class 
It's like their week has ended. You know, they, they're just spiraling. And why is it that? Why is that happening? Um, it's just to be in a class, like, but it's so, they make it so tremendous. So, um, you know, this is a lot of best practices of things that um, we've come across in a lot of the training and research that we've done, really how we can try to build in some of this resilience. And certainly schools are, you know, can do some of this resilience training within schools or some of these skills can be brought on in schools, but parents need to do it. You know, it needs to be taking place also in the home. Um, parents need to know what's going on for kids and how their reality is and how they're functioning um, and understand that it's important for them to be <coughs> resilient because they have to go out into the world on their own at some point. Um, but parents are often don't want their children to be uncomfortable. They want them always to be comforted. So um, out of love, they try to protect them, but sometimes um, what happens is they don't know how to cope. But certainly electronics, you know, can be a very unhealthy escape. So if they have a lot of exposure to that, a lot of hours, um, maybe they're, they have free reign of it. Maybe they're up many, many hours on electronics and parents aren't really watching that. Um, you know, it can be very, it can become very unhealthy. Also, kids um, that are very anxious, a lot of times they're caught up in this perfectionism, this per perfect achievement um, that they have to get straight A's. If they don't get it straight A's, they're not going to get into college. Um, you know, even parents sometimes use that, that type of language, like, oh, if my child gets a B in a class, they're not going to get into college. And, you know, we know that that's not the reality, but the, the, this is some of the mindset that sits out there. Um, but that perfectionism drives a lot of anxiety uh, in kids that fall into that profile, very, very anxious um, because of the, this achievement that they've set this very high expectation for themselves. That's really almost unachievable. Um, they lack some of that emotional skills, like that emotion, the ability to regulate emotion. You know, to understand you can get angry or you can get sad and you can be happy, but um, this idea that they can't, they just get so upset, they can't calm themselves down. They don't know how to emotionally regulate. Um, and, you know, the parents protecting them from some of these challenges. This lack of unstructured pet play, um, kids have been very programmed. Um, there's a lot of play groups and there's a lot of structure to activities, but sometimes kids need that unstructured play, you know, to go outside and just to play with kids or just to do something that's not in front of a screen. Um, that's really where a lot of creativity comes from, a lot of imagination. Those things are really important and it also is a chance for them to also deal with some conflicts maybe. So if they are having some social conflicts, they have to work it out. They gotta figure it out, they gotta problem solve. Um, if they're not getting those opportunities, then they're not gonna learn some of those things. Um, and the parents' place in the family <laughs> structure, Alex sort of talked about this, this, um, this dynamic in the home where things are flipping um, and the parents are losing some control and the kid has more control in the household than the parents. And that may be also parents um, not knowing what, how to set boundaries, um, parents wanting to be their friend's kid, you know, their friends uh, with their kids, um, and also, you know, wanting to comfort them all the time, like always to do something for them. And so that creates the no boundaries in the household and things get a little gray. Um, but that unstructure um, or that flip structure can be very, can lead to a lot of dysfunction for kids that they don't really function well. Um, so some resiliency factors, these are just uh, factors that really build resiliency and these are things that kids uh, need to engage in, um, learning how to manage stress and emotions. We talked about that emotional regulation, really important. How can they manage stress, giving them strategies of how to do that. Unfortunately, I think what happens sometimes for kids is that it's modeled for them how to deal with stress because the parents may be very stressed. They're not managing their stress very well. Their kids are <laughs> observing that and that's the role model for them. So if the parent isn't handling their stress well and they don't manage it well, how do they expect their child to, right? Um, so, you know, there is a, that piece of it where parents have to kind of check in with themselves too of what they're, they're modeling. Um, kids have to believe that they're good, um, that they, they feel like a good person. They need to go back to basics of eating and sleeping well. Um, the sleep is a huge factor. We know that, the science says that. Teenagers that have lack of sleep are more likely to be depressed. Um, so sleep is a huge factor. Um, 
view, viewing failure as a process and you know something that is just in that learning process. It's not this, I have to avoid the failure because now, now they start to fear failure. And if they fear it, they're always going to get away from things that make them feel uncomfortable. But failure is actually a really important thing for them to learn because that's part of life, right? Um, they need to feel autonomous, the physical activity, getting out and moving around, having caring adults in their life, knowing that there are adults they can turn to, um, avoiding those risky behaviors, and feeling connected, feeling like they have friends and people um, care about them. They are actually check in with them. So they may have friends online and they may have kids liking things on their social media accounts, but if they go to school every day and nobody is coming up to them and saying, hey, how's your day today? or nobody's checking in with them and just showing a general interest to them, they don't feel connected. Even though, though they may have these connections online, when they are in school and around other kids, if they're not talking to them and kids are not extending themselves, they may not feel connected at all. Um, and some, you know, from a parent's perspective, protecting their own home, um, how they can do that. Something that Alex and I came across is protecting the four cabinets at home. Your liquor cabinet, your gun cabinet, your medicine cabinet, and then the internet. Those are the four things that parents need to protect <laughs> when you're looking at mental health and substance abuse. You know, are parents keeping those things in check? Are they aware of um, how these things are accessible to their kids? Kids are getting liquor from their homes. We know that. That's where they're primarily getting it from. So if they're getting it in their homes and their parents are either giving it to them or it's laying around and it's easy for them to get, they're going to get it. So there needs to be a conversation about that or parents need to understand that accessibility because that's the primary place of where they're getting it from. Um, and certainly access to guns is a huge factor when you're looking at suicide prevention. Children that are mentally ill and suicidal, if they have an access to gun, that puts them at a very grave risk for suicide. So if there is access in the home, they may access that. And if parents are not protecting that, if they have a gun, is that, that could be um, really life-threatening. Um, and then their medicine cabinets, what are they getting in their medicine cabinets? That's, you know, kids are going into them. That's where they're getting the Xanax. They're getting painkillers. They're getting those, those things in their medicine cabinets. Are they given the, those medicines themselves? I, I come across a number of kids who take their own medications themselves, their parents, and these are things like, you know, a Xanax or a Clonopin, or they're taking these medications on their own. Parent is not regulating it. Um, the kid may even put it in their backpack and take it to school. They have no idea that there's, you know, rules against doing that. But there's just no guidance about that. And so parents really have to have those kind of conversations. And certainly the Internet. What are their kids looking at? What are they getting exposed to? Having conversations about that. From a school perspective, you know, we tried our best, you know, in terms of addressing these things that come up that are, that are, in, um, that are online. Right? If a major issue comes up, we're going to address it. If it's brought to our attention, we're going to address it. But we have all these students to take care of, right, and to look after. Parents are the ones that should be checking their kids' internet and looking at what they're doing. That's really their responsibility. And, you know, parents usually own the phones. It is their property, so they can have control over that. Um, and we talked about these things, the screen time, the boundaries. Um, those things are really uh, very important for um, parents to recognize and encouraging appropriate reporting. Um, I think this, a lot of this kind of goes back to some of this bullying things that go on. Um, sometimes we see some of this reporting coming in as, you know, immediately my child being bullied, but sometimes th these things are conflicts, um, and that's where we have to really look at that, right? We got to really look at what is actually that information. And if the, the child is being told in the home, like, oh my gosh, these are all terrible things and this is what's happening, and they're sort of escalating the situation, um, and then it comes into school, it, it can just be, you know, it, it could be more, more difficult to address that, right? But parents <laughs> need to be appropriate and, and encourage their kids of how they're reporting this and really understanding for what it is, right? that maybe it's conflict. Um, and just, you know, being responsible about that, okay? And ultimately, they are the parents, so they get to make these choices um, and what is happening with their kid, right? They sometimes have to make some difficult, you know, choices. Being a parent is a very difficult job. It is. 
It's very, very challenging. Probably the most difficult job anybody will ever have. So people need to take it seriously, right? Um, so they can't necessarily, you know, be their kid's friend. <laughs> um, they have to set some of those boundaries. May I interrupt for one quick second? Yep. So I'm done. I'm wrapped up. So if anybody has questions. Sure. If you don't mind, I want to go back to, any, you don't have to go to any slide. Okay. But just the topic, topic of anxiety. Yes. Because it's something I'm familiar with. Sure. Uh, I found that uh, definitely it's something that's clinical. It's not like, oh, my child feels yes. anxious. It's a clinical thing. Correct. And a mental health professional, some are better than others. And the right ones will actually help the child with coping mechanisms. If you feel this and you feel this coming on, you need to go into plan B. You know, step one, recognize it. Step two, take a walk around the block. Step three, you know, so it's almost like autopilot things, coping mechanisms. Uh, and I find that the right mental health professional can be very valuable. Uh, is it the policy, uh, does the administration or do, does your staff have ties with the community yes. with appropriate health professionals. Yes, absolutely. And Al, I would say Alex and I are probably the, the two people in district that probably have the most exposure because of what our roles are. We're definitely two people that are out in the community more um, and reaching to those, those therapists and going into those pra practices and meeting these people and seeing what they're about and wanting to hear from, you know, what their practice is, what they're teaching these kids, and it's what just they're the doing. Two of you. Um, it's just the two of us. I mean, there's certainly other school counselors and child study team members also have that same, you know, background in terms of doing referrals. But I would say we are probably the two people in district that are out in the community even more than anybody else um, in, in getting that information. And I would say, from my experience, a lot of people in the high school, when they do, do need to do a referral, they come to me first and they ask me. They'll say, who would you recommend? Because of my experience in going and really meeting some of these people out in the community more. I would agree with you 100% that they need to be connected with the right services, absolutely. And well, that's why I always tell parents, ask me. Please come and ask me. Don't just go out there and go get somebody. Please ask. Well, you know, getting you, that if, input is important. If you both and if Mike, if, if you and the administration can also keep tabs on this, all the ingredients in the pot are getting worse. Yeah. As you described with the drug, with the with the accessibility to drugs and the likelihood of laws that are going to change in this state, the stress levels are going up and not down regarding pressures from colleges, etc. So uh, please keep an eye on your staffing and please make your needs known to Mike and to the board, mm -hmm. because I, this is something that we cannot let slip. So one thing that we do have is we do keep a referral list um, that that we maintain. Um, and those are people that, you know, we're going to access and make sure they're still in practice and what they're doing. And that's a list that we keep internally. Um, when we do make recommendations, we don't just like hand that whole list out. We will, um, looking at that child in particular or that family, that's where we're going to say, okay, of these people that we know, we're going to try to handpick somebody that's going to be a good fit. Yeah. And so that's what we really try to do the best because we know that. We know when a child gets into the office, we want to make sure that that's going to be a good fit. Because if it's not, and it doesn't work out, um, it could be just delay that process more and more of them well, getting the help that they need. We want you to know that there's, we're stewards of the taxpayers' money. And we're, we're overseeing an extremely competent administration. There are things we don't want to spend money on. And we can talk about those. There are things we absolutely <coughs> would love to spend the taxpayer money on. And we, and we encourage you to make sure that you know that. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Hi, a lot of what I, I, I'm taking in here seems to um, be focused on the 6th to 12th grade. Yes. And what I feel like, um, based in my world and, and my history with my children, is that it's almost being pushed down. And that in the 4-5 grade level, their stressors are triggering these kids. Um, and I was wondering if you've, what you've done to look at that, or do we have a process in place right now to identify even at-risk kids younger ages, because they are seeing more social media and those stressors earlier, because the phones or so things are getting interfered. For the most part, that's being handled by school counselors, right. so like at the fourth, and child study team members. Okay, so they're the people that are primarily the ones that are doing those interventions down there. Um, and they are very busy. 
they are. They're quite busy, I will say. Um, and, and we talk to all of them. I mean, we're, we both consult with all of them, all, you know, whenever they need to, especially school counselors. I mean, we'll, we call back and forth. They'll call us if they have a question. We really try to keep it that way because we want to all help each other. Um, we're not in those schools, but we certainly will help in any way in terms of consulting with them. If they have a challenging case or something that's going on, we'll, we'll be a part of that process. I guess I was wondering if you just saw like um, a, a trend, cool, a trend like you are yeah. in the upper grades with the lower um, grades. That was, I guess, where I was going. I guess I can't speak specifically to that, but certainly the data and the risk assessments is showing that that there is an upward trend. Okay, in terms of those <coughs> risk assessments, we haven't done those surveys at that younger level. We don't have any data on that. Correct. We don't have correct. <laughs> yeah, we but don't I, have any I data. would agree. I would agree. Four, but, or five, or I think we just had one uh, within the past few days, as a matter of fact, uh, mm -hmm. and. We have a terrific counselor named Cindy Weiner at Lafayette who uh, really is dynamic and communicates regularly with yeah, Lisa we, and Alex. Definitely. Um, and I, I did want to mention to Sal's point, we do also have a partnership with Project Community Pride, which is run out of the Madison Y. And uh, they have seen an increase in Chatham students also yeah. uh, in recent years. Actually, I, let me just share a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we will do a referral out to them. They, are, they have four licensed clinical social workers on staff. And they have a private office separate from the Y. Um, but the, when we do a referral out, those families get free service. Um, and it is individual counseling as well as family counseling that they provide. Um, it's a wonderful service. It really is. It's a, a fantastic service and works very well. But they service not only Chatham, but they also service Florham Park and Madison. And right now, they, their caseload is very heavy on Chatham. That's primarily where all their clients are right now in Chatham, and they have a six-week waiting list. So I just put in two referrals last week, and they said they will wait six weeks. That well, goes back to Sal's point on getting maybe in-house resources dedicated to the Chatham students. You got to stay ahead of it. Right, I think that's where Sal was going. Do we need to hire a full-time? Well, I. I I mean, from our perspective, since we're doing more crisis, instead yeah. of could we be doing more of the intervention uh -huh. and really working with kids and right. doing more of that, that counseling, um, certainly we probably could be doing more and less of the crisis if we had more support staff. Right. Absolutely. N without a doubt. Um, and certainly somebody with that um, clinical mental health kind of background, somebody that, that understands that. <laughs> Then we'll look, we'll look to you to make some recommendations, mm -hmm. um, you know, through Mike and to the board. I, we're, we're starting to run out of time. Are there any yeah. other? We've actually run out of time. I'm sorry. And sorry, no, you want to? And did you have anything else from a curriculum? I don't think so. No, thank you very much. Okay, for thank you. Time. Thank you, guys. Great job. Your time for your presentation. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. We clap, but I don't feel like clapping. <laughs> yeah. It's all very clap. My family.